This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today we're addressing two major topics. Rod Hembry of Bible Discovery TV joins me later in the show to discuss the impact of the pandemic and how the church and we as individuals need to respond. But first, Black Lives Matter has become an outcry not just for African Americans, but many Americans who believe that our nation is still not addressing racism and injustice. Well, today I'm joined by pastors Bill and Lintham Laris. As a biracial couple, they pastor a culturally diverse church in Columbus, Ohio. And I believe they're a great couple to ask how Christians should respond to the Black Lives Matter movement. But right now, racism in America is just at the forefront. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a flashpoint all across this country. And uh, uh, you guys see it maybe even more in Columbus than what we see in, in some other, uh, other areas. But how is it affecting your church? Yeah, you know, it's... it's well, how does it affect you personally, too, the two of you? Sure. I mean, well, it's painful. Yeah. It's painful to watch. Yeah. I think it's painful mm -hmm. for our kids. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a 19-year-old, we have twin 17-year-olds, and of course they've grown up their whole lives being biracial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've had mm -hmm. talks, we've had hard yeah. conversations, mm -hmm. we've had talks about people yeah. treating them differently and such, and, they, and they've experienced things here and there. They're really but, in the middle. I mean, but yeah, 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 absolutely. But now, it just, just recently even, we thought, wow, yeah. We have to hit this again. We yeah, have to talk right. about this again. They, they, you know, they've had friends turn on them because they weren't black enough, white enough, and, mm -hmm. and or um, having the same viewpoint or opinion of the culture of society. And so it's tough. It's yeah. not easy being a parent yeah. right now. Yeah. And then we definitely begin to see it creeping into the church um, because, our, you know, we've had people constantly coming to the church, right? Mm -hmm. So the foundation that we started the church, and then you have new people coming in who didn't hear the foundation of the church and something like this happens and all of a sudden people are faced with how do I really yeah. feel about this? And they didn't have the, the groundwork to deal mm -hmm. with it right. and <clears throat> now it's in their face again. And so we actually end up having to have a we call it a family meeting at our church to, to talk mm -hmm. about this because we're hearing this group of people saying these things and this group of people saying these things and then they're fighting with each other. Not really fighting because they're not talking to each other. They're just commenting on posts and it just <laughs> began to be, okay, we got to yeah. see that. We got to deal with this. Social and, and media definitely. Uh, has the ability mm -hmm. to just incite, mm -hmm. incite <laughs> things and make away people from things be st yeah. misunderstood. Yeah. And so we, yeah. we did, we had, a, we had a family meeting. We talked about social media etiquette. We talked about how to handle misunderstandings, mm -hmm. how to have conversations that go beyond mm -hmm. three or four sentences of a statement. And we do have to address it. But as a church, we weren't going to let strife and division come into our church. And we're, we're just not going to sit back. You know, our whole pastoral team said, um, when we said we're going to do this, they were, they were ready. Yeah. They said, hey, we're, we're ready to be a part. Well, the three words, black lives matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The three words, black lives matter, has, has now become extremely divisive. You've got a cancel culture where where if you don't support, I mean, if you're a corporation and you don't send money to the organization, hashtag Black Lives Matter, you're canceled. And people say, don't, don't buy from mm -hmm. them. Even if you believe Black Lives Matter. Right. That, it's, a, it's a division there. And how do you handle that in the church? Yeah, you know, what I, what I tell our people is those three words, Black Lives Matter, I believe are holy words. Um, I believe that that mm -hmm. that statement in a, alone represents the kingdom of God, where we're saying, hey, there is a people group right now mm -hmm. that are hurting, mm -hmm. they're injured. Mm -hmm. there, are, um, yeah. there are things that have come up from whether it be systemic racism or economic disadvantages and, and truths and, and, and uh, prejudices that, that have come up, mm -hmm. stories from the past that are now resurfacing and, and things that we're seeing that are just obvious injustices in our land. And, and, and violence. So, and violence and, and such. Violence. So we, we're saying, my goodness, that this, these are holy words. Black Lives Matter. And we need to be saying that. We need to be listening. But I do also think, and, and this is something yeah. we had to talk about to our people, was there's a major difference between the words Black Lives Matter, which we wholeheartedly mm -hmm. celebrate, and an organization that happens 
to have taken those words, right. uh, which I believe are holy words, and then created an organization, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, and that organization, and we don't have time to really go right. dive into it, yeah, but that organization, just go to their about page yep, you go to on their, their website. Yeah. Yeah, you and go you to the read. manifesto. Oh, yeah. They and don't just believe. Read. I mean, it's, it's the, the to tear down the family, which is the basis yeah. of what, what you guys are talking yeah. about. And and I'd go back to Matthew twenty-five when 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 Christ is saying, "When did you feed me? When did you clothe me?" Mm -hmm. And and when we value the least, and I don't want to say the black lives are the least, but when we value the most hurting, mm -hmm. then we really are valuing Christ. Right. Absolutely. And that, that's what we've got yeah. to value. How do you do that? Uh, in, in, in church, when, you, when you're explaining that, what did, you, what did you say when you had your family meeting? That, that, did people leave? Did people say, I can't, I can't do that? What, what was the no, response? No, people stayed. They listened. Uh, we actually, um, a beautiful part at the end of it yeah. was, we gave people an opportunity to repent. Yeah. And people, uh -huh. um, they didn't have to explain everything, but they would just yeah. raise their hand and say, uh, I want to repent for, and they just make a statement like, you know, being insensitive, mm -hmm. uh, not standing up for my black community yeah. that we're hurting, not listening. Mm -hmm. And although it wasn't planned, yeah. it was spontaneous. We believe it was uh, just mm -hmm. led by the Holy Spirit. One of our other pastors talked about it in a panel discussion. And then at the end of it, um, I just knew that needed to take yeah. place. Mm -hmm. And so we gave people an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. And we had people hugging it out at the end, you know, sure. so it was, it was a beautiful time. It really was. And you, and you believe the spirit can carry that on. Yes. I mean, hugging Absolutely. it out at the end and then mm -hmm. saying, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna share this in our real life. Mm -hmm. What yeah, because that wasn't were, just a, yeah. a one-time meeting yeah. that we're never going to have it again. Yeah. We'll probably have another one and say, hey, how are things going? Mm -hmm. But we do have expectations that whatever you learned from this discussion, that now you're implementing it yeah. in your life. Mm -hmm. Now you're responsible for it. You can't, you can't use ignorance or I didn't know no. as an excuse to post certain things or to say certain yeah. things or treat people a certain mm -hmm. way because we we put shut a light on it. So ignorance is no longer an excuse. An excuse. Sure. Now we are going to hold you responsible for what you say, what you say. and how you treat others. Yeah. I have a Hispanic friend who's from the Dominican Republic, and he says, but, but all lives matter. Mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's serious, and he feels that, and, he, and, he, and he's been, you know, he's, he's suffered some of the same racism, but he's, he's a white guy, but he's from the Dominican Republic. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to somebody who says, yeah, but do they not understand the relationship between Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? Right. We, uh, in All Lives Matter, they do. Of course they do. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, you'd probably at this yeah. point in life, you'd have to be from another planet yeah. to not realize that all lives do matter. And as the church, yeah. as Christians... But that's also incendiary when you say it. Yeah, yeah it, of course. And, and so oh, it's like... Especially on, on yeah. social media. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. All Lives Matter, what we need to say, what we find is people... They don't want to say Black Lives Matter. They just want to say All Lives Matter because that's an easy truth yeah. to hold on to. But 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 for that to be yeah. true, you have to be willing to say, say Black, Black Lives Matter. And so what we right. did as a really quick, easy um, analogy to understand was that if in your neighborhood one house was on fire, mm -hmm. you send the fire department to that house yeah. to to work on that house. Mm -hmm. You don't hose down the entire neighborhood. <laughs> right. That's a good and analogy. so the idea yeah. is it's black lives right now who are hurting, who are feeling in feeling less mm -hmm. than. And we need to pour out our love and our compassion and um, grace on those lives right now. If someone else's yeah. house is on fire, then we will we sit do the, same, we'll do the, we'll do the right. same thing when that yeah. house is on fire. But we need to focus on the one that's on fire right now. Yeah. Well, this, this, this house has been on fire for a long, long time. Yeah. And we've had this before. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've had mo a modicum of reconciliation at different times. Mm -hmm. Things get better, something happens, yeah. it sets it off again. When, when, when is, can we eradicate social injustice? I mean, and there's, there's hope in the church, mm -hmm. but in our culture and society with, with uh, the enemy roaming about, is, is it, or how hopeful are you? <laughs> Well, you know, these last few months, uh, I think the hope level, um, if you're just looking at things in the natural, mm -hmm. is like, oh, I thought we were beyond this. Yeah, um, well. And, but you know that we, we are not a people without hope as, as a Christian. And so our hope is, yes, 
the kingdom of God needs to continue to advance because mm -hmm. as it's advancing, mm -hmm. we are dealing with uh, racism. We're dealing with uh, people feeling less than, people yeah. being mistreated. We're, I mean, there's so many issues. There's mm -hmm. so many social issues out there. We're just right now just talking about uh, the, the social injustice, but there's so, it, that's such a large is. issue. Um, but what we can't do is be so focused on that that we uh, take our attention from Jesus, take our attention mm -hmm. from hearing the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. taking our attention from um, doing the things that we know we're called to do just because we have this major um, uh, issue facing us right now. We can't allow petty arguments and such and distractions mm -hmm. to keep us yeah. from the ultimate goal. What do you think that, that is, is, is enough progress, is mm -hmm. enough social justice that gets people off the streets? That's not going to cure the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Is this is this is a, this is an ongoing? Yeah. We've got to be we've got to be cognizant and aware of it and and mm -hmm. uh, intentional about it all of our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think there um, we need to see change. Yeah. Yeah, what, what what change would you would you really embrace? What change right now would you see if it mm -hmm. came out of the, the current situation? What change would you really embrace, Lena? What would you say? We have mm -hmm. really made some progress. I think I, I can only speak for the environment and mm -hmm. the um, sphere of influence that I have. Sure, okay? and it's different than, than a lot of people. Right, yeah. and so um, Chip Judd um, is a, a powerful uh, marriage counselor and pastor and whatnot, and he said this statement that I think applies to so much stuff. He said, um, all we can do is raise healthier children than we were. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amen. Like we're, we're trying to, uh, we're, it's going to be very difficult for us to make a perfect world. Probably is not going to happen. Time. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we can, if we can be actively choosing to create a bet, to help rear our children to be better than we were and instill in them that your goal is to make your children better than you were. Mm -hmm. And we keep passing that down because we're probably not going to see a world completely eradicated of racism. It's a fallen world. But right. what we can see, a group of people choosing in their sphere, mm -hmm. I'm going to make my world yeah. a better place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, politics, mm -hmm. of course, things need change. There's mm -hmm. systems that need change. There's, there's policies mm -hmm. that need change. Their change needs to take place. And um, we need to, you know, we encourage yeah. Christians to do the right thing when they vote mm -hmm. and such. But ultimately, uh, the buck stops with us. We have to be willing mm -hmm. to do the hard work. Light, yeah. We have to be willing <laughs> yeah. to be the salt and the light and the earth. I mean, we have to say, mm -hmm. you know what? Again, I come back to the fact that we're going from just saying, I'm not racist to I'm against racism, mm -hmm. I'm anti-racism, mm -hmm. which this implies automatically action. Action. Yeah. Action. Well, what you were talking about just now, Lynn, is, a, is another whole show. <laughs> We've got, <laughs> we got to get you back for that. But you're, you're at uh, you're, you're Oasis City Church yes. in Westerville, Ohio. Yep. Give us some of the places people can, can co contact you. Yeah, I mean, you can go right to our website, mm -hmm. oasiscitychurch.com. Um, our social media pages are very active. We're on Instagram and on Facebook and YouTube. You can watch just all of our services live. Just saw you on YouTube. Yeah. Great, yeah. great, yeah. Live, so, great yeah. live feed on YouTube. Yeah, and so we have a great mm -hmm. church, a great community. We have a great pastoral team. Uh, worship department, music, and, and we're, we're really um, trying to represent the kingdom as best we can. For more information on Pastor Bill and Lynn's church in Columbus, Ohio, you can find them at oasiscitychurch.com. How has the pandemic impacted the church? Has it pushed a timeline ahead for the end times? When we need a biblical readout or anything like that, we bring in Rod Hembry of Bible Discovery TV. Rod grew up in Ohio, but later moved to Canada, which gives him a unique perspective on how God's timeline is unfolding, especially now in the pandemic. When this first started, I don't know whether, whether it started and ramped up at the same time or simultaneously with the United States, or was it ramped up in Canada at the same time? But did you have a feeling in your spirit that we'd be where we are, but also that, that God would use this in some, in, in some of his ways to, uh, to further his kingdom? I learned that the church is going to be challenged and the church is going to be questioned. Now, God allows this to happen. He mm -hmm. didn't create the virus and all that, but he allows this to happen. 
and the church began to explore and starts to learn about the internet. And that's interesting. Yeah. The other thing I learned is that we understood that fellowship is different than friendship. Fellowship is different than friendship. Fellowship is deeper. When I come to my church, I can talk to people about how good the Lord is and what God's doing in my life and all of that. When friends with somebody, I talk to my neighbors. They know where I stand. I told them about Jesus Christ. And, you know, they said, well, stay off the Jesus thing. But I talk to them, you know, well, how are you doing today and all of that. But the friendship is not the same as fellowship. Fellowship is unique, and it's different. So we learned a lot about each of us, and uh, we learned a lot about each other, and we learned a lot about the Lord. Fellowship is important, and it's so different than friendship. So I think that's important as well. Yeah, I think we also learned, at least down here, we learned uh, very, very quickly, the church has learned how, how impactful the Internet could be. I mean, we went, my wife and I went to church with a cup of coffee and sat on our couch for about six weeks there just watching, watching our pastor on Sunday morning with an empty, uh, an, an empty sanctuary, but preaching the Word of God. And they, and they were telling us at that point in time that they were reaching more people through their live stream than they did in their live services prior to that. I mean, our church is about 1,500. They were reaching an additional 1,000 people. They could tell by the I Internet. Think- the, the important part of that, um, I think, for us is that I have been a promoter of the Internet for a long time, mm-hmm. and we've been on the Internet since 1996 when it first started broadcasting and everything else. But the church suddenly was shocked into, we have to telecast and we have to pay attention to what we're doing on the Internet because the main audience is now on the Internet. Yeah. It's not with us. And so we, we have to focus on that. And, and it, it's been a very positive experience for many churches. I, I would say it this way. Anything human has to demise, but anything spiritual has to rise. And I believe that the spiritual aspects have risen and people have seen that. And that's very important because God, again, used this time and this element to remind the churches and the pastors that their audiences aren't just in the local community, but they're now are around the world and in different places and different spaces. I think that's very important. Would you consider something like COVID when you, when you look at what's happened with the church and with people's response to it, our response to the government, people coming in line to the government a little bit more, do you see that at all in the timeline of God's prophetic movement? Um, I, I actually do. Um, the, you know, Matthew 24 is an amazing passage yeah. of scripture and, uh, it tells us, you know, Jesus left the temple and was going away with his disciples and came to a point and they showed him the buildings. And he said, truly, I say to you, truly, I say to you. So in other words, he's telling him the truth. Absolutely. And he says, there will not be one stone left upon another. And then he goes into this when they come back to him later on and ask him, Lord, what did this mean? We didn't understand this. And he begins the sequence of 24 and 25, Matthew 24 and 25, to tell the story of what will happen and the times that it will happen. One of the things that Jesus Christ says is there will be earthquakes and famines and different Mm -hmm. kinds of things ahead of the end time. He says, these things will happen. He says, but the end is not yet. And then all of a sudden, he starts talking about the end, <laughs> and he says, now this is the end time. So I, I do believe that this is unique. Now, people have said to me, yeah, Rob, we've had this before. Yep. We did. The, the problem is when we had it before in 1918, we didn't have the Internet, and very mm-hmm. important, we didn't have Israel. Israel, Israel is the key. Right. And uh, in 1948, the nation emerged, and since that time, the war has been declared on it by 21 nations around it since that time. Very important. 1967, they gained through the miraculous, amazing provision of God, they gained access to everything, including Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yes. Now you've got a big statement in Jerusalem. And so Israel is here, and the church is the first church in 2,000 years, roughly, to share the space on the planet Earth with the nation of Israel. 
And that is very significant. We need to pay attention to Israel because God is working with her and we need to listen because the Lord is getting ready to do some amazing things. And when you look at, you said that another thing we were missing back in 2008 or uh, 1918 was the internet. And with the internet now, we, we have instantaneous communication. Every eye in the world could possibly see what's happening in Israel. Everyone could see what's happening with the Antichrist. It could be broadcast worldwide instantaneously. We didn't have that 10, 15 years ago. No, it, you didn't. And you can watch it on your phone. You can watch it on your computer. You can watch it on anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said to me, yeah, but Africa doesn't have Internet. I said, hold on a minute. Africa is very, very advanced in the Internet. They have all of their devices on the phone. I mean, you go over and you can buy a cell phone very inexpensively in Africa. And uh, a lot of people have. Them. And the statistic was given me. There are six phones, cell phones, for every child born in the world. And that was given to me last year. So you have children being born, but you have six phones for them, waiting for them when they're born. So that's amazing. That's, that's absolutely stunning. Daniel 12 also says something interesting. He says, God says to him, you know, bind up the prophecy until the time of the end. Mm -hmm. And in the time of the end, when people run to and fro, and you ask yourself, well, I mean, what does that mean, people running? But actually, if you look at the definition of the Hebrew words, it actually means travel fast. So when people travel fast. fast to and fro, and when the emergence of science grows, 94% of all science journals are less than 50 years old. They're, they, they've happened. So this is the time when the prophecy, when it's when we're ready for the Lord to begin to make his moves, and he, it looks like he has. He started to make some significant moves. What do you, th what do you see then should be the response of, of individuals as well as the, the church? Let's kind of divide that up, the church response and the individual response to any of these things. When we, when we look at, everybody says, well, you've talked about these things before for years and years, but now we, we know we're closer than we ever were. We know that for a fact. But we may be really close on the, on the edge here when we t start talking about what's happening in the United States and how the world views the U.S. And uh, what, what should our response be individually? And then what do you think, that, how, how should the church respond to encourage individuals to respond properly? That's a great question. Um, I think the, the way that individuals respond um, is not to buy six months of food and hide in the basement. That's not mm -hmm. the way to respond. The way to respond is exactly what Jesus Christ told us to do in Matthew 28. Go into the world and tell the good news to every single person. As many people as you can, communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. If ever there was a time when we could communicate the good news of Jesus Christ so that people could understand what's going on and how it's happening, it's today. It's now. Go on YouTube and Tell your testimony. Don't tell any, don't make up anything, but how did God change you? Just give your testimony. And if they cut you off, so be it. But just give your testimony on Facebook. Get on there and just give your testimony. That's it. Record it and leave it on there. And we need to tell people about who God is individually and, and also individually. Secondly, we don't need to live in fear. We need to live in faith. You know, God said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, Paul said to Timothy, he said, listen, don't, God did not give us a spirit of fear, right. but of love and of power and of a sound mind. For the Bible tells us this in advance, so we have a sound mind, so let's live that way and let's understand that. Very, very important. The second part of that question you ask, what should the church do? Oh, it's so, so simple and so obvious. <laughs> Whatever's human in the church has to demise. Whatever's spiritual in the church has to rise. So we need to make sure that we clearly hear from God and clearly touch the, the hand of God in all of our activities and all of our things. There's, there's lots of good ideas. I mean, I've done this before, too, as a pastor of a church. I, I had good ideas and I had God ideas. And sometimes I did the good ideas and they were not good. And then I did the God ideas and it seemed like they'd never work and they worked like crazy. And so we have to understand that God is, we are the church and that God brings individuals together for fellowship, we have to listen to the Lord. I think that's very, very important. So that's my advice anyway. 
Do you see a you see an, an urgency among the pastors that you know, an urgency to really get back into? I don't want to say get back into teaching the word, but I mean it's, it's a lot of focus on churches have been in events and brick and mortar and growth and and outreach and things like that. But to get back into making sure that their congregations understand how to study the Bible and to and to know it, to begin to really dig into it, to give them the the inspiration to dig into it. You, you hear you're hearing that from pastors. I. I... I, I am not. I'm hearing a lot of shock and a lot of disbelief, and I hear a little of that, but that's growing. I think we need two things to remember in the church. Number one, we need to have evangelism. We need to tell people about who God is and in the church, because preaching to the church, half the church is not even saved, more than half the church. So we need to preach to the church. Secondly, we need to preach to the community. We need to tell them about who Jesus Christ is. And then we, very important, thirdly, we need to do what John chapter 8 says, verses 31 to 32. Jesus Christ said, if you are my disciples, you will abide in the word. You will live in the word. We need to get the word of God into us. We need to study it. We need to know it. And uh, that's those are the two main factors that I would say today, evangelism and study the Bible. Preach, don't preach psychology here. Preach the Word of God, because that's the most important psychology. Well, if people in that audience out there right now aren't getting it in their church, they can sure get it from Bible Discovery. <laughs> how, 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 does people, how do people find your show? Uh, well, they find our show uh, in, it, you can just look up uh, on the internet, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Mm -hmm. And when you look up Bible Discovery TV, it'll take you to a place, and that's where we are. But BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And, what, and uh, you can watch the programs and all of that. If you can't remember that, just look up rodhembry.com. Rodhembry.com. What, what are they getting in your show, Rod? What, what, what's, your, what's your focus in those shows? Uh, we, we broadcast from Genesis 1. We read through the entire Bible to Revelation 22. Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years of writing, and it's the Word of God. And we study it every day. We study 15 verses of it. We have a reading assignment, and then we each year we study different verses. And uh, the verses that we... I'm, I think I'm on the third year of going through studying the different verses. So, But you can get on board right now, because a lot of people, they think reading the Bible, man, that's yeah. over 733,000 words. How can I do that? Well, regardless, what we can do is study 15 verses a day from every part of the Bible. It's very interesting, and it's very important. You can find more on Rod Hambry at Bible Discovery TV, and you can listen to other Viewpoint interviews we've recorded recently with Rod and other prophecy experts by finding Viewpoint with Bob Placey on your favorite podcast app. Thank you for joining me today. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.